a panicky end of a country, South Vietnamese soldiers strip off in retreat. As the hours passed, the men from the jungle flowed into Saigon. In these uncertain hours, we decided to show our neutrality and the fact that we were not Americans by attaching a Union Jack to our hired car. Most Vietnamese, brave enough to be on the streets, were too busy plundering to take any notice of the BBC car. In the chaos, immediately before the communists took over, the offices of the American Consul General next to the embassy caught fire, possibly a diversionary act by Viet Cong agents. The frenzy of looting went on, as if Saigon's consumer-mad people were extracting their own brassy revenge from the Americans, safely steaming off in the evacuation fleet. As I exited on the last aircraft, I felt like a dog with his tail between his legs. My operations officer was sitting across from me, and he was literally weeping. When the chips were down and we didn't carry out our promise, it was less than honorable. And I uh, didn't feel happy about being an American. Looking back today, from the vantage point of 20 years, one can see that in the end, South Vietnam was a hollow husk with no motivation or tensile strength of its own. Deserted by the Americans, who had withdrawn all forces four years earlier, Saigon had lived on borrowed time under a corrupt regime. When the North Vietnamese launched Operation Ho Chi Minh in 1975, even they were amazed by the speed with which the South collapsed. By April the 27th, Saigon was surrounded. The Americans left their evacuation dangerously late. Fifteen hours before Saigon surrendered, hundreds of Vietnamese besieged the embassy. A large number had been promised to seat out, but many were left behind. The helicopters in Operation Frequent Wind were heading for the American evacuation fleet lying off the coast of South Vietnam. Cobra gunships of the US Marines were supposed to protect the embassy. Dawn on the last day with signal flares on the rooftop helipad. A final battle was raging at Tonsonut Airport on the edge of the capital. But although the advancing communists could see the American evacuation, they didn't interfere. The last helicopter came in for a handful of US Marines, a humiliating end to the American presence. Those rockets kept coming in and the airfield was closed. We had planned to ship about $5 million worth of $20 bills, which we had on our hands that morning to the Thai, over to Thailand to get rid of it. It was enough to fill a good-sized bedroom with $20 bills. You think I'm going to put money on board these helicopters instead of human beings? No way. It was wired with thermite grenade, the same sort of thing you would use to destroy classified documents. And the Marines simply set it off, and it was burning when we left. On Saigon's waterfront, people lost their common sense and swarmed on board ships, hoping to make the journey down a river that had already fallen under the control of the communists. Soldiers began to destroy or change their identity cards. In old Saigon, there was always someone to sell a boat ticket to nowhere or a new identity. Such were the final moments of blind panic. Personal survival first. The lack of concern for the weakest and the helpless was never more apparent. Many senior officers and politicians had already left. This naval vessel trying to run the gauntlet was later sunk. I think what happened is too, too quick and too fast, you know, the debacle. So I think it caught American by surprise. I really think, you know, it caught them by surprise. So they didn't have enough time, you know, to organize the, the evacuation. I still had my own helicopter. 
a radio gentleman from the aircraft carrier Midway. He guided my uh, helicopter to land at the aircraft carrier. And then I, I just stood there, you know, crying like a baby. <laughs> yeah. The number of Vietnamese who were left behind can go up to the millions. I had a friend, a Vietnamese friend, who called me the morning of the last day. She said, you've got to get me out. I was working on another analysis for the ambassador to try to persuade him it was all over. But instead of tossing the paper aside and going out and helping my friend, I stayed there at the typewriter working. She killed herself because I couldn't reach her. I made the wrong choice like lots of Americans in Vietnam. I forgot that there were bodies out there, that there were people's lives at stake. The troops stormed in soon after South Vietnam officially surrendered. The palace guard put up no resistance. The first moment that resembled scenes from a revolutionary film. A communist soldier came out carrying the flag of the now defunct South Vietnamese regime. Many soldiers had spent four years in the jungle with no letters from home. But they hadn't forgotten the correct revolutionary stance. To them, this was a war of liberation. Inside the palace, General Big Min, the caretaker president, waited for his new masters. This was our car. We started off the morning with the Union Jack. The Union Jack's still in town, but the car isn't. It was taken at gunpoint by a South Vietnamese army colonel, the man in charge of this sector of Saigon, and he was determined to die or to kill the North Vietnamese and communist troops who even now are advancing into Saigon. The car was a write-off because a North Vietnamese, a communist tank, ran right over it. This is all that's left. So our car didn't halt the advance, but the rest of the communist column was blocked by South Vietnamese looters. A new experience for the highly disciplined northern soldiers. Why didn't the North Vietnamese choose to really attack in that final 48 hours? They could see that what they wanted, that is, getting rid of the Americans was going, was happening. And I think if they uh, had come in and, for example, captured me and my staff, it would have placed them in an embarrassing position. Since the fall of Saigon, symbolic gestures have proved predictable and irresistible. The monstrous military gargoyles that dominated central Saigon through the American phase of the Vietnam War came under the communist hammer. It was entertainment for everyone. The gargoyles proved as hollow and insubstantial as the regime they represented. Twenty years ago this week, peace did come to Vietnam, but poverty and repression continued under new masters, and the world lost interest for a long time.